Hello, students. I hope you had a good uh, INI CET exam. Uh, now, don't worry about the result. Whatever has been, uh, whatever you have done, the result will come definitely on that only. But uh, just relax, chill, and prepare for your next exam, right? Um, for anesthesia, there were three questions from core anesthesia, and one was, which I would say I would discuss here, uh, was from neonatal resuscitation. And most of the question, which was from the core anesthesia, the three questions, they were very expected question. One was from ventilation, which we expect always to be asked in exam, especially in INICT. And other was resuscitation. Again, a very probable question from anesthesia. So let us start with the first question. The question was, a patient of acute pancreatitis intubated on ventilator with following setting. The setting of the ventilator is given. Tidal volume, 420 ml. Respiratory rate, 32 breaths per minute, PEEP, 12 centimeter of water, FiO2, 0.9. And after, let's say, 20 minutes, an ABG must have been done. And in the ABG, the pH was 7.33. PCO2 was 48. PO2 was 110 mm of Hg. HCO3 was 28. And saturation was 100%. And, uh, so what is the next step in management? Let's say change in the ventilatory setting is what they were asking. And in the option was, to decrease FiO2, decrease respiratory rate, increase tidal volume, increase PEEP to 14. Well, uh, now we put a patient on ventilator to maintain the oxygenation and ventilation. And meanwhile, we treat the primary disease of the patient, which in this case uh, is acute pancreatitis. Now, in acute pancreatitis, which is one of the known cause of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, because of the release of the inflammatory mediator in the blood, the lung, uh, the, the, the lung damage happens. The patient goes into acute respiratory distress syndrome. And for patient in acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, we always go for a lung protective ventilation. So we have to protect the lung, ventilate, treat the primary condition and maintain the oxygenation and ventilation of the patient. So what is the initial setting which we do in these patients? So we always go for low tidal volume ventilation mode. The mode which we choose in... Uh, initial mode which we choose is assist control mode. We always prefer to choose assist control mode. Tidal volume which we keep is eight to six to eight ml per kg body weight according to the ideal body weight of the patient. In this question, the body weight was I, I have not been provided with the body weight, but definitely I think in the question uh, original question there must have been body weight. I'm assuming it is 60 to 70 kg. And according to 60 to 70 kg, now 420 ml of tidal volume is adequate. Now, respiratory rate, we keep 14 to 16 breath per minute. We start according what is the respiratory rate of the patient when the patient is being put on the ventilator. We keep near about that. So normally we keep 14 to 16 and we can increase it to 35 to keep the pH below 7.25, right? By tidal volume and the respiratory rate, we have to maintain the ventilation. We have to maintain the ventilation. So ventilation of the patient is maintained by tidal volume and the respiratory rate. We don't want to keep a high tidal volume and we can increase the respiratory rate till 35 to keep the pH below 7.25. So these two will maintain the ventilation. And ventilation, what will it control? The maintenance of ventilation will control PCO2 of the patient, which in our patient is 48 and pH is 7.33. Both are tolerable. Both are, which we can, little bit, it is towards the higher side. Normally it's 35 to 45, it is 48, but we can tolerate a 48 mm of Hg of PCO2 with pH 7.33. So ventilation is more or less adequate with this setting in this patient. Now coming on oxygenation. Now, FiO2, normally we start with FiO2 of 100%, but we try to bring the FiO2 below 60% as quickly as possible because 100% FiO2, even above 60% FiO2 is a toxic FiO2, which itself can contribute in ARDS. So initially we start with 100%, we try to decrease it as fast as possible. And PEEP, we start with 5 to 10 centimeter of water and we gradually increase if oxygenation is not maintained. So for oxygenation, to maintain the oxygenation in a patient on ventilator. The two factors which are necessary is FiO2 and PEEP. Okay, FiO2 and PEEP. So in our patient, the FiO2 was 90%. That is 0.9 we were giving, 90%, which is a high FiO2. And PEEP was 12, which is all a good PEEP, right? But, and we were also maintaining the PaO2, that is 110 mm of Hg, saturation was 100%. So our purpose was being solved. Rather, it was little more being solved. PO2 was 110, 
PaO2 above 60 is what we target, right? By keeping a minimum FiO2 and minimum P. Okay, so we have to just target PaO2 above 60. And in this patient, it was good above 60. So PaO2 is adequately achieved. So we will try to reduce the toxic FiO2 of this patient as the first uh, initial change in the ventilatory setting. So in this patient, what I will do as a next step would decrease FiO2 because both PaO2 and PCO2 is more or less what we require in a patient. PO2 is little more than what is required. Okay, we will not decrease the respiratory rate because already PCO2 is towards the higher side. And by decreasing the respiratory rate, it will further increase and pH can decrease. We will not increase the tidal volume. We won't want to increase the tidal volume in these patients. We go for low tidal volume ventilation. And PEEP, we will not increase because oxygenation is already maintained. Why to increase the PEEP? So we, what setting we will do? We have achieved what we wanted, maintaining oxygenation and ventilation in this patient. So we will try to descalate and we will decrease FiO2. So answer would be A, decrease of FiO2. Okay. Okay. Now coming on the next question. The next question was an image-based question. Now this image I have discussed in my chapter in monitoring when I was discussing about invasive blood pressure monitoring or uh, radial artery cannulation. Now, this is an uh, image of something called Allen's test. Okay, so answer is Allen test. Now, why do we do Allen test? Allen test, this is the image of Allen test. And Allen test, we do to see the patency between the collateral of radial and ulnar artery. But, you know, our hand, it has two major artery, radial artery and medial side ulnar artery. And we have a very good collateral system between the two. So if there is a problem in one of the artery, then also the uh, vas the perfusion of the hand would be maintained by the collateral of the other artery. So let's say if I have to cannulate the radial artery for invasive blood pressure monitoring, before cannulation, we check whether the patency of the collateral between radial and ulnar artery is there or not. Otherwise, if radial artery will go into spasm and the, the collateral is not good, then the area supplied by radial artery would get affected. And to check this, we do something called Allen's test. For Allen's test, there are four or five steps what we do. First, we make ask the patient person to make a fist and just flex their um, uh, arm at a, a hand at elbow and try to exsanguate the blood from the palm. And then we apply pressure on both radial and ulnar artery. So we apply pressure on both radial and ulnar artery and then ask the person to open his fist. When the person open his fist, the, uh, the, uh, the palm is pale because of already exsanguation of the blood from the palm and because of the compression of the both arteries, the blood supply is affected. So palm is pale. Then slowly we remove the pressure from the ulnar artery. We remove the pressure from the ulnar artery by maintaining the pressure on the radial artery. And if the again the palm becomes, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the color returns to the palm, it again becomes red, right, uh, pinkish, from pale to pinkish, within 5 to 10 seconds, then we have a very good collateral between radial and ulnar artery. And cannulation of the radial artery can be done. So this is called modifies Allen test, which we do before cannulating the radial artery. So answer for this question is Allen test. Okay, so this was our second question. Now coming on the third question, again, expected question from CPR. The question was, which is incorrect about CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation? Well, this is a very expected question. They have asked about high quality chest compression. Now remember, whenever someone has no pulse, no pulse and no breathing, we start with high quality chest compression. And for high quality chest compression, five points is what we have to remember. This is a repeat question, which was asked like uh, two years back in INI CT exam only. Now, this time again, they have repeated the question. The first option is, first thing for high quality chest compression, push fast. We push fast. That is 100 to 120 compression per minute. Push fast. So the rate of compression should be 100 to 120 compression. So this is correct. No, I'm not marking the question. I'm saying that this is correct answer, right? This is correct option, okay? Then push hard. We have to push hard. That is at least we have to push six centimeter, five to six centimeter, at least five centimeter, not more than six centimeters. So push hard. Then allow complete recoil. Allow complete recoil. We allow the complete recoil of the chest, right? So allow the chest, adequate chest recoil. Otherwise, again, the heart will not get filled. Then fourth, uh, minimum interruption. Minimum interruption. Minimum interruption in 
chest compression. Chest compression should be priority in CPR. There should be minimum interruption. And last, just adequate ventilation. Now, ventilation is important, but overventilation is deleterious. So just adequate ventilation. So for just adequate ventilation in adult, we keep the rate, respiratory rate, 10 breath per minute. We don't have to increase it beyond 10 breath per minute. So in this, right, uh, this was also right, the cup depth should be between five to six centimeter. Respiratory rate of 20 to 25 is not something which is done. This is not a part of high quality chest compression. So this is incorrect. So answer would be respiratory rate 20 to 25 breaths per minute is wrong. High respiratory rate, increase in top abdominal pressure, aspiration can happen. High respiratory rate, decrease venous return, perfusion will not be maintained. So it is not plausible, not, not, uh, not to be done in CPR. Okay, so this was the third question. And the last question is true about meconium stained lichen management. Well, this is more of a PTT question, but I've just taken this question just to discuss a few things with you. Uh, if a baby is born and he's meconium stained, right, what is the management? What is the AH American Heart Association and American Pediatric Association, they have passed the latest recommendation. There are a few points in the latest recommendation which we need to know. First, just go through the options and then I will tell you the answer after discussing the recommendation. So first option was tracheal suctioning, mouth suctioning. Tracheal suctioning, first the endotracheal suctioning, then the mouth suction. Okay. Second, gentle suction of mouth and nose in vigorous baby. Now, what is vigorous baby? In a second, I will tell you. Intrapartum suctioning. Intrapartum suctioning was what we used to be practiced earlier before 2005. I'll tell you what it is. And suctioning of mouth and nose after shoulder delivery in non-vigorous baby. So we'll talk about this also. So first, what is the recommendation? So neonatal resuscitation team and suctioning in delivering room. What is the resuscitation? What is the recommendation for them? When the baby is vigorous, what do I mean by vigorous baby? That is a baby with a good muscle tone, breathing or crying at birth, and heart rate more than 100 breath per minute. This is called vigorous baby, right? Now, if vigorous baby, they are, they are meconium stained also. They, the liquor is meconium stained also. We don't always require to do suctioning in them, right? We just, we do the initial step of newborn care and hand the baby to mother, right? We hand over the baby can be handed over to the mother. Now, most vigorous newborn do not require suctioning, do not require suctioning at birth. If necessary, just remove the secretion by wiping. Wipe, we wipe the face, the baby's mouth and nose with a soft cloth and nothing else. Okay. And if baby is having a little bit problem in coughing, which we can clinically perceive, then by a bubble, let's say bubble syringe, we can just suction out the mouth, not use suction catheter. Right, with which bubble syringe is a soft suctioning method, right? So we just uh, take out the secretion. If the baby is not vigorous, not vigorous means that baby does not have a good cry, baby heart rate is less than 100, baby is little cyanosed, right? Not vigorous. Then this baby is what we do. We give it first, we do tactile stimulation. We gently suction the mouth and nose. First mouth and then nose. Why first mouth? Because if we will suction nose first, baby secretion of the mouth, baby can aspirate. So first mouth, then nose. Okay. If baby does not respond, right, then we can use a bulb syringe or suction catheter to again to gently clear the suction from mouth and nose. And if baby is not breathing or baby is gasping or baby has poor tone and secretion is obstructing, right, and baby is having difficulty in clearing the secretion, we can go for positive pressure ventilation. And if heart rate is also not increasing, we can further go for positive. So first tactile stimulus, then gentle uh, suctioning, first of mouth, and then of nose. And then we go for, if baby does not respond, they go for positive pressure ventilation. Now tracheal suctioning, now routine endotracheal suctioning for non-vigorous baby who are meconium stained, it is not nowadays recommended, right? And management of meconium ba stained baby, same way, for non-vigorous babies in with a clear amniotic fluid. So management is more or less same, even if the amniotic fluid is clear. So in this, uh, uh, let's say, options of this question, tracheal suctioning, tracheal suctioning first nowadays is not done. Tracheal suctioning nowadays is first not recommended. If it is not, it is not done. Then so first option is incorrect. Gentle suction of mouth and nose in vigorous baby. First mouth and then nose. 
in vigorous baby. Okay, this is a correct option. If this baby, if vigorous baby is not coughing and we see the little bit of problem in, sec in clearing out the secretion, we can go for gentle suctioning. The word gentle is very important. Why? If you will do a vigorous suctioning, then it can cause bradycardia and cardiac arrest in these babies. So we always go for gentle suction. So I, according to me, this is true. Then intrapartum suction. Intrapartum suction that when the delivery is happening, when the face of the baby comes out, then suctioning is done before completely taking the baby out. Now nowadays it is not recommended. This is called intrapartum suctioning. The suctioning of mouth and nose after shoulder delivery. Well, again after shoulder delivery, face delivery, again suctioning of mouth and nose in non baby. No, intra. This is again option of intrapartum suctioning, not done. Nowadays, intrapartum suctioning is not done. It has no added benefit. So what is true I'm seeing in this question is the second option, gentle suction of mouth and nose in vigorous baby. So four question I discussed, The this was my last question, which I discussed, two for meconium stained liquid management, gentle suction of mouth and mouth first, then nose in vigorous baby. The second question which I discussed, what is the what is which of these is incorrect about CPR? What is incorrect? Respiratory rate 20 to 25 per minute is incorrect option. Respiratory rate should be 10 breaths per minute. Then the image-based question, image was given, and what was the image? It was Allen's test being performed. And the last question which I discussed, that a ventilatory setting was given, a P ABG was given, and what is the next step in management in ventilatory setting? Well, uh, in this answer was decreased FIO2. So I hope you have got all four questions correct. Thank you for your patient listening and best of luck for your results. Thank you.